from the Sumire Foundation and Connor B. Judge Foundation, this is Demystifying NMO. Hi, welcome back to Demystifying NMO, where we talk all things related to NMO, neuromyelitis optica, spectrum disorder, and related neuroimmune disorders. I'm Chelsea Judge, scientific advisor with the Connor B. Judge Foundation. Today, I'm going to share a conversation I had with my brother, the Connor B. Judge himself, we talk about treatments related to NMO in a phone call that we had. I think it's really important and potentially very helpful for patients to understand the difference between acute or managing relapse, that type of treatment, versus maintenance or preventative treatments that people take long-term to prevent future NMO relapses. And then giving you an idea a little bit on how they work, maybe that offer you the ability to understand why you're taking these medications, why they're effective, or maybe how they work differently from each other and why, why you might try a couple different types of therapy or treatments to manage your disease overall. So I'm going to share the phone call with my brother now. Hi. Hey, Connor. So is now a good time to talk a little bit about NMO, the relapses, and how you treat them and stuff? Yep, of course. Okay, great. So how are you feeling today? I'm all right. I'm just tired. I'm having some coffee right now. So I thought maybe you could talk a little bit about what your relapses in the past have looked like. Maybe you don't go through all of them, or you do, um, and then how you and your doctors handled those relapses. Well, for the most part, this was before I was on an uh, immunosuppressant. I just had a couple minor uh, optic neuritis attacks, and I would get like slightly blurred vision, eye pain, sensitivity to, sensitivity to light. And when that would happen, I would uh, notice it pretty immediately. And as soon as I did, I would call the doctors or go to the emergency room. And soon after, or pretty much immediately, I would be treated with uh, high-dose steroids. I know, obviously, since I know you, that your first relapse was very severe and you didn't just use high-dose steroids. Can you talk a little bit about that? Is that even considered a relapse? Isn't it just like the initial attack? Yeah, you can say it's the presenting attack or presenting relapse. It was a very severe relapse, yeah. Well, yeah, the first, yeah, that was terrible. So... What first happened is I noticed blurred vision, slight blurred vision, and lots of eye pain. Mm -hmm. And I was doing landscaping at the time in the summer. So that, and I was had to drive a trailer. So that would make things really hard, really complicated. Probably should not have been driving because of my vision. So I went to the doctors for that, and they gave me like a small steroid pack. Did that help at all? I'm just curious. I can't remember. It did help slightly. My vision got a little bit better, not perfect, but it stopped getting worse. Okay, well, that's good. That also makes sense because that's how steroids work. So I took that. I think it was uh, half. It was supposed to last me a week or two. And pretty much immediately after I was done taking that, the eye pain and the blurred vision came back. And then I started noticing, like, slight numbness and Mm -hmm. tingling in my legs. So you needed, like, something bigger and better than those, like, low-dose steroids you were given. Yes. And so I went to the doctors again after, like, probably two weeks of having the leg pain or, yeah, like, the numbness and tingling. And it started to get painful. So I went to the doctors, and they didn't give me anything. Because they didn't know that you had NMO. You didn't know you had NMO. Correct. And so... I don't know, a couple more weeks went by and the pain got to be so excruciating. I had to call off of work. I remember three days I was in the most excruciating pain of my life. I would like, I did not eat. I like hardly slept. I sat in a bathtub because for some reason I felt like the water helped the pain slightly. So I pretty much just lived in the bathtub for three days trying to help the pain. And then I think it was... It was either the third or fourth day I got tried to get out of bed and I could not move my legs. So I called my mom and I she told me to go to the ER. So I called to my car and I went to and my girlfriend of the time drove me to the emergency room. And from there there was a great neurologist there that he pretty much knew I had NMO. And then, but like for, to treat that actual steroid, they gave you like high dose intravenous or IV steroids. And then they also scheduled you for like how many rounds of plasma phoresis, AKA plasma exchange or plex? How many rounds did you get? So yeah, I got the high dose steroids. 
hospitals. And then I got, I think the high dose steroids I got for like five days. So yeah, then they did five rounds of plasma for recess uh, okay. over 10 days. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So like, so now just going to how these acute relapses are typically treated is high dose steroids for sure. They tend to be either intravenous, like a thousand milligrams for um, or that'd be one gram every day for like three or five days. And they can also be given orally at like 1250 milligrams, um, also same time. And, you know, just as you pointed out, there's really potent or good anti-inflammatory effects of steroids like methylprednisolone, but they just help speed up the recovery and keep things from getting worse, like you pointed out, but they're obviously like not a cure and then it can be used um, along with plasma exchange. Again, like you said, for like five or seven cycles. And what seems to be extra cool about plasma exchange is that um, it doesn't just have this vague anti-inflammatory effect. It's actually taking out the blood, getting rid of all of those uh, bad autoantibodies and other uh, soluble or inflammatory things that are in your blood, and then putting back in, you know, quote, clean blood. Does that, that makes sense, Connor? Uh-huh. Have you ever heard of IVIG? Yeah. Intravenous or IVIG or IV immunoglobulin. Some people also use that um, to help with manage relapses. And that can be, you know, that the treatment dose varies for that. It can be for about three days, treatment periods for eight weeks. Um, it, this has a, a more interesting, it's not totally known how this um, works, but it, potent anti-inflammatory properties seems like it can make the, um, like cause inhibition of some of those like inflammatory immune cell mediators. It's, it's really interesting. It seems to be very effective. And then sometimes um, physicians, neurologists might treat with cyclophosphamide at a couple grams every day for about four days. And this just inhibits those white blood cells that are autoreactive in NMO. It, it kind of shuts off their uh, cell division. That's just my little science plug for it. But I think like what matters most is like what's effective for people. And for you, that was obviously the high dose steroids and plasma exchange. And I just want to say like, I didn't notice anything from the steroids when I got the, after the high dose steroids, mm-hmm. so yeah, I, I had, my vision was completely back and that was all good, but I didn't notice any improvements in my legs at all. But I think it was after the first or second round of the plasmapheresis, I was able to slightly move my toes. Oh my God. I do remember mom being like, Oh my God, he can wiggle his toes. That was, was terrifying. So now, like you said, you're on an immunosuppressant. Can you kind of talk a little bit about what that is, why you're on an immunosuppressant? So after I was out of the hospital, I had to go see the neurologist and talk about my treatment plan. And luckily at the time, there was this clinical trial about to happen. So that was an option for me. She went over some other options, but I thought it would be cool to be in a clinical trial. And at the time it was called uh, Medi551. And now I believe it's called. it has a real name and it's like, in a belizumab? Yeah. If, if I said that. You, you did. And all of those monoclonal antibody names are weird. I, you killed it. And so I had to wait for this trial to start. So I was just taking steroids up until then mm-hmm. for a few months. And then when the trial started, I, I was, uh, since it's a clinical trial, it was like I could be on, it was, I could have been on placebo or I could have received a real drug. We don't really know. But I had uh, one relapse, and then after, of optic neuritis. And then after that relapse, um, I was given, I was for sure given the real drug. So just like for people who aren't familiar with that trial, it was a three to one ratio of either being on the drug, which depletes B cells, or being on placebo. So, you know, it favored that you would be on the drug. But of course, you're right, there was that like 25% chance you weren't. But then uh, for Patients who were enrolled in the study, if there was a relapse, there was like called like a rescue protocol so that if you had um, a relapse, you could be appropriately treated for the relapse, however your neurologist wanted you to be. And then you could automatically be put on the drug if you weren't already. So the whole point of being on these like immunosuppressants, right, is that they call them like maintenance or preventative treatments. In your mind, what does that mean? I guess that means pretty much that I just won't get any worse, that I would not have another relapse. And if I do, then I don't know. It won't be as bad. I don't know. 
the treatments, the preventative treatments or maintenance therapies are all to prevent another relapse from happening. And you're right. Like if you do, it's the whole idea of maybe your relapse is now, maybe, maybe uh, they won't be as severe or as frequent. Yep. That's the way it seemed to work for me. I've had one since I was for sure on the drug. For NMO, that sounds like it's working for you. And obviously you're really good now at identifying when a relapse is happening so you don't go blind or paralyzed potentially. Yes, I pay probably too much attempt, attention to like anything that could go wrong in my body. You're better safe than sorry. Exactly. I'm just going to go over the, some of the typical treatments that are used for preventative treatments, um, otherwise to help reduce the relapse rate like we talked about. And if people ever want to just have a handy um, tool, we actually have a nice table of all the different types of treatments on our website. So that's connorbjudgefoundation.org slash science and under the what is NMO tab. Like you said, you were using high-dose steroids, prednisolone, monthly before you got your treatment. So some people are doing that. They're using, like, pulsed steroids regularly. I think we hear a lot about this off-label use of rituximab. You know what rituximab is, right? Yep. It's pretty much, it's it's another immunosuppressant. Um, it's very similar to the drug that I'm on. And my neurologist said that, uh, inabulizumab is pretty much just an improved version of rituximab. Yeah, they're both B-cell depleters. So some people can get rituximab about every six months, which I'm pretty sure is what you get dosed at too, right? Yep. Yep. So we've talked about two B-cell depletions. Um, some people also get plasma exchange regularly, again, to deplete those autoantibodies and other um, inflammatory makers. We talked about cyclophosphamide for um, handling a relapse. Some people also can get this as maintenance therapy, again, to prevent those white blood cells from dividing. Others can get different types of these general non, um, non-specific immune suppressants like um, azathioprine, blocking synthesis of these adenine and guanine we found in your white blood cells. Some people will use mycophenolate at high dosages or varying dosages, also um, creates immune suppression, targeting pretty much the T and B cells, which again are playing a big role in NMO. Other people might use uh, mitoxantrone. It can intercalate your DNA and just, you know, get in your DNA basically cause, um, inhibit cell division. You can only have so much. Your max dose is at 120 120 milligrams. And then finally, some people use methotrexate. It's another um, blocker in DNA synthesis, so inhibits those white blood cells from replicating. So you see this link here, right? Like these generals stop the white blood cells from replicating or making more of themselves. What? All of these different (laughs) therapies. All of these different types of therapies or general immune suppressants that I talked about other than the B cell depleters are targeting the white blood cells and preventing them from like dividing or making more of themselves. Yeah, that's what I got you for. <laughs> yeah, but I think that's just good to know, right? And it's like those were general immune suppressants, but with some of the um, emerging monoclonal antibodies like the inabolizumab or rituximab, they're slightly more specific. Like in your case, you're targeting just B cells, getting rid of the B cells in your blood. And that's theoretically good because they'll stop activating their T cell friends, stop making autoantibodies like that AQP4 or MOG, and stop making um, some of those like inflammatory uh, things that they can also make and it's bad for NMO. Gotcha. So, Connor, I'm sure you've heard people talk about 2019 as the year of NMO because there's all this great uh, potential for therapies to come to patients. Yes, I have. I know there was one drug approved, FDA approved, that came from Alexion. Yes. I forget the name of it. Okay, so that one is a mouthful, echolizumab, otherwise named as Solaris. Solaris, yes. Yeah. And then I know that the drug that I'm on should be FDA approved pretty much any day now, right? Echolizumab, Solaris, and Inebolizumab had really great uh, phase three or phase 2B clinical trial results showing that they could like really strongly um, reduce the relapse rate compared to placebo. So that's awesome. Echolizumab is approved for those AQP4 positive patients. Um, they have to get 900 milligrams weekly for four weeks, and then they go on a maintenance dose of 1,200 milligrams every two weeks. Connor, I know that you uh, hate pop quizzes, but do you know how this drug works or thought to work? No, nope, no clue. Okay, so have you ever heard of Compliment? Yeah. Okay, and you've heard 
like that it's really inflammatory, right? Um, no. Okay. No, compliment, compliment as in like you use it along with another drug. Oh, no, but that makes sense. So compliment, yes, that, <laughs> that's the definition of compliment. But there's actually this thing in your immune system. It's this inflammatory cascade that will literally lice or rupture its target. This is really important in bacterial infections when your immune system goes to war against the bacteria. But for whatever reason, it, we see that there's like a bunch of complement, this infl inflammatory cascade activated in NMO. So eclizumab prevents that uh, from happening. So that it blocks that inflammatory cascade. I see. But because complement activation can only happen with the presence of an antibody, it's only um, indicated for those patients who are positive for that AQP4 antibody. And I was negative for both antibodies, right? Yeah, so you're very interesting. Most people, uh, like 70 to 80% of NMOSD patients are AQP4 positive. Not only are you not, you're also a male, which makes you especially rare. And they tested me for all that before I was on steroids, right? Um, They tested you like while, like when you were acutely presenting. So they tested you like, I don't know, within the first couple of days. So, I mean... I hear, I see where you're going with it, but if like you had that antibody in your blood at that time, they it would have been positive. And there is some fluctuation. Some people can you know trans like go uh, zero positive or negative. You hear that, but you actually had um, were tested for it twice and were negative. Okay. And then I just wanted to highlight one more um, emerging therapy, which is an IL-6 receptor blockade. So a couple of core trials, one in combination with other um, maintenance therapies that were positive, and one as a monotherapy with, that was also positive. So that's also really exciting to have potentially three approved therapies. Connor, I think um, you've probably heard of orphan drug, right? Or orphan, orphan category. Yeah, it's pretty much like rare disease. Right? Yes, exactly. So the government had this orphan uh, disease designation, and the the rule for that is it has to affect like less than 200,000 in the population. And you know how rare NMO is. Yep. I believe it's approximately 4,000 people in the United States have NMO and compare that to MS where it's around 400,000. So because I'm a nerd, it seems like MS might, it was always said 400,000, but it looks like actually in the, like the recent data update, it might affect up to a million people. That makes more sense. Yeah, you know, you're right. But like, yeah, you're right. NMO is really rare, like five to 15,000 in the U.S. So super, super rare. Anyway, because of that designation um, as an orphan, as a rare disease, the FDA can like have a special category for drugs for those orphan rare diseases, and that's the orphan drug designation. Basically, it make research go a little bit faster and not have to require such like a strong number of people to study since it's so rare. Mm -hmm. Currently, there are a few drugs that have this orphan drug designation for NMO by the FDA. You can find the list for these orphan drug designations for NMO on the FDA's website under um, or by searching for orphan drug designation list. Interesting. And Connor, you've heard like some people um, will be misdiagnosed with MS and how bad that can be. Oh, yeah. And I'm sure that happens way more than we even know of. Because I know that if you're on a drug that uh, is for MS, it could actually make the symptoms of NMO worse. Connor, thank you so much for talking with me, representing the NMO community. Yep, love doing it. If you would like to follow our foundation, you could go to connorbjudgefoundation.org, or you could also support uh, us by going to the sumarafoundation.org. And on both of our websites, we have a survey you guys could take to uh, give us feedback to see what we could do to make this podcast even better. Awesome. Thanks again, Connor. And thank you all again for joining in and listening to Demystifying NMO with the Connor B. Judge Foundation and Sumire Foundation. Stay tuned for our next podcast in just a few short weeks.